Hey yo, welcome to episode 9 of the Meta My Music Show, where I interview various people from around the music industry, whether they are musicians, artists, producers, engineers, studio owners, and the like, about their musical journey and how they got into making music, some of the major insights that they've learned on their journey, and their general approach to the creative process. And today I have a lovely chat with Ryan Caldwell, who owns his own studio, runs it, he plays in three bands, he's an amazing musician, awesome dude overall so stoked for that but before we dive in i want to mention that i just created a free masterclass called how to master the three secrets of the creative process and i've jam-packed it full of actionable insights that i've learned on my 10 plus year journey in making music producing music writing music mixing it so if you're interested in checking that out you can find it in the link below and with that said with no further ado let's go ahead and jump into the episode Welcome to episode nine of the MetaMind Music Show, where I have amazing conversations with amazing people from all around the music industry, whether they own a business, they're artists, musicians, studio owners, all the whole spectrum, everything. And we uh, talk about their musical journey and extract their experiences, their insights that they've learned on their journey and just get to know them a little bit better. So today I'm joined by Ryan Caldwell, an amazing musician, studio owner, all around awesome dude from Chicago. So what's up, Ryan? How's it going? Yo, uh, I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. It is a delightful Tuesday. It is still rather chilly because, you know, Chicago in the wintertime. But I have a feeling you are used to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being in Canada, definitely know what winter's about. Uh, but yeah, you, I would say you guys know what winter's about out there too. We we winter out of our weight class, but I'm always reminded by the fact that it just keeps getting worse the further north you get. <laughs> and there's just like two states above us worth of winter before we even get to the border. So it's, you know, it's nuts. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Like winter gets pretty bonkers here. It gets like minus 40 Celsius at the worst in winter, but you keep going north here and there's still so much more north of canada and it gets worse yeah it just keeps getting worse until people don't want to live there anymore yeah until no one lives <laughs> anywhere <laughs> yeah that's hilarious although you know what it's it's funny because all the gigs also dry I'm not, I'm not sure how it is around you but most of the gigs dry up pretty severely in the winter oh yeah also because no one wants to go out everyone just wants to go and hibernate and pretend like they don't have clinical depression <laughs> and uh then but so me and some of my friends were like well what if what if we just like kind of phone it in, get like a really, a really like low balled cover set together and then go just down south where there isn't winter and all the bars are still open and then just play a bunch of those. <laughs> that sounds like a good escape. That sounds like awesome times. That's actually, we, I have a theory with a few friends, whereas colder climates pushes everyone's inside when during winter, but it yeah, also yeah. is a breeding ground for like insane creativity during that time. Oh, Cause like, what sure. else are you going to do? <laughs> I, I was gonna say yeah i had a uh what was it i so like covid kind of did a, a similar thing except it just did that year round <laughs> <laughs> but it, it gave it gave a bunch of people like hey just sit on your thumbs and uh do stuff inside and so it was almost it was funny because there was this giant kind of changeover with uh with bands and stuff but i ended up using it to go and be like oh i, I have a second now I'm going to go and finish a bunch of tunes that are just rotting on my hard drive and have been for years and then release them. And so that was kind of, that was kind of nice. Totally. Yeah. yeah it's, it was a good opportunity to see some like silver lining where you're like, hey, I can, I can finish some creative projects and maybe even start a new one. So that's sick. That's awesome. Silver lining in those things. So Ryan, let me know, what are you up to these days? Like what's up in your world musically, studio wise, otherwise what's up? Um, I am doing, I've got a few albums in the works right now. So I'm doing, so I'm, I'm in three groups that I'm gigging with pretty actively. Jesus Coyote, Invisible Cartoons, and Woosh. Nice. And all of them are making albums. And then uh, apart from that, I also own a recording studio. And I have a couple clients that are coming out that I'm uh, producing albums for there too. So between those things, I've been... I've been pretty busy recently, so. Hells yeah, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot <laughs> to unpack just in like one a few few phrases there. So, okay, 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 let's start with, you're in three musical projects, three bands? I am in three bands. Three bands, what do you do in those bands, Ryan? Panic. No, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, the, uh, I, so in, so Invisible Cartoons is the one I've been in the longest and I'm okay. there, I am their lead guitarist. Okay, nice, nice. So I'm, uh, 
and I, I'm not playing any like two handed keyboards in there, only guitar. And that's a lot of fun. We play like super happy funk music. It's smile rock. Nice. They're okay. going on a decade old, but I've only been them for been with them for about five years. Okay, cool. So nice. doing that's a fun. lot of stuff with that. We're working. We get, this album has been a long time coming. It's called um, uh, what was it? Sci-fi disco carnival. <laughs> that and sounds like a trip. <laughs> oh, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, our lead singer is also a filmmaker, so there is a companion film he's planning on making. To, uh, to kind of go with the album after the fact, because that production process is going to take a hot second, because, wow, film and audio have two entirely different product-like arcs. Absolutely. I was talking to a friend of mine with that, and he was like, oh, yeah, so now it's going to be another, like, maybe year and a half, two years before we see this again. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I can release something I made this week. <laughs> yeah. All the stages could happen within one full week. But, you know, but that's kind of the beauty of the mediums, right? I just don't have that much patience. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, so that's Invisible Cartoons. That one's kind of fun. Uh, so that that one's definitely going to be, that's going to be an awesome album. I'm really excited for all the tunes on that. This is also the first album where I've had a really heavy, like a bigger hand in writing more of the parts. Because, okay. you know, we released uh, an EP when I had kind of recently joined the group. And I was on like a, maybe a couple songs in it. Right. But I didn't really, I wasn't there for the writing. I mostly just, you know, got here and was like, I'm going to make key parts for everything now, <laughs> whether or none. So, but this one is more of like a, some of the songs are built around some of the parts I've written instead of, you know, tacking just them on, on at the end, yeah, like yeah. a sticker. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that one's cool. Whoosh is another really interesting one. That's me living my best psychedelic rock life. Oh, so and, good. Love it. Right? Yeah. And it's also just, it's a crazy project because everything is super co-written. Like, well, they'll come in and bring stuff in, but it's all going to be completely off the wall, gratuitous riffs everywhere, like really fast a lot of the time. But that one's kind of fun because it's a no rules project. So there's not like anything stylistically we're shooting for. We're just doing whatever we feel like exploring yeah having fun yeah. yeah and i've been so happy with the results because they've been they've been sounding they've been sounding pretty good and so that's going to be exciting but it's also a band full of chaos so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you put no limitations there's inherent chaos that you have to tame which is fun this is another oh, challenge yeah. <laughs> well you know and, and also everyone in the group is incredibly creative nice but it, it means we are short on bean counters <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm, we're 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 we're, very, we're really short on uh, on people who who are really good at uh, was it dotting no no dotting their eyes and crossing their t's. I always mix that one up. <laughs> I always dot my t's and cross my eyes. I um, like that better. <laughs> yeah, right. So that one. So whoosh is going to be awesome. We're we're actually almost done tracking all the instruments. I am unfortunately the bottleneck for that has ended with me. Nice. As, uh, <laughs> Well, cause I'm producing it. So right. like, I'll record everyone else's stuff first because I want to know where the gaps are that I need to fill and not fight something. Right. Um, but that also means that now I have to go and carve out time to go and do that. Right. Right. I'm not so, sure if you ever experienced that where it's, um, where it's really easy to go and book time with other people. Right. Yeah. Or like go and set aside times like, Oh, you're going to come over and we're going to track that. And then, Boom. It has caution tape all around it in your schedule. But for stuff where like, now I need to go and track something. But especially if you're doing, because my studio is based out of my home. I'm like, I could go and record this, but I also need to do laundry. Yes. <laughs> and then fold said laundry. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different beast when yeah. you're your own boss, so to speak, when you have to manage. Like, because if you have someone else involved, you're tracking for someone else, or it's a paid gig, or you're working with a client. Right. It's like for it's somewhat formal, where someone else is also expecting to for something to happen. But when everything's your own, like you're running your own business, or you're recording all your own music on your own time, then it's like, oh, I could, I could also just wear sweats and like eat cereal. <laughs> like, right. It's like I could also not. I could yeah, I could wake up at like four in the morning and grind my entire face off. <laughs> but I could also go and wake up at noon and uh have less muscular fatigue. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So with uh these three projects, I'm assuming that you're having a role in the production of all the albums or or somewhat involved. Yeah, so I'm helping produce the invisible one, 
the guitarist uh who's also he has he has a studio out in berwin illinois which is okay. like like a little bit closer to chicago from where i'm at like gotcha. i'm not like i'm around chicago but i'm like the outer crust of the suburbs right gotcha so it's just like you know suburbs but then 15 minutes out only cornfields and soy right right <laughs> yeah but then only 45 minutes and then i'm in the center of the city so gotcha well on a good day not during rush hour <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i'm producing I'm, I'm helping to produce the invisible one the whoosh one i'm definitely i'm i'm producing as well of course that one's a little less heavy-handed with the production because we've been playing these songs live for some of them for about a year others for a little less than that um so everything's kind of already dialed in it's not like i'm sculpting a sound necessarily right it's already i'm just trying to right i'm trying to kind of do with like a steve albini and go and just be a plumber for it say just get the sound in there without (laughs) any impedance you know or well well, with the proper impedance yeah Uh, (laughs) audio humor yes um but for jesus coyote though that one's a little bit of a different animal because we're going for this kind of white stripes, black keys, Queens of the Stone Age style sound. Nice. Where I'm, we're looking, we're kind of putting our feelers out there and seeing what people like the most and what we like the most as far as how to represent it. But with that one, I'm doing some really crazy shit with um, like uh, doing... I'm just doing a lot of experimenting with how to get like heavier tones with a more robust palette, how I'm trying to go and represent the drums in there. Because, you know, like, uh, cause you have a, you, you do a lot of recording work and production. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you, you know, you know, as well as anyone that drums is not a one size fits all thing. Oh, there's no, as many different types of drum sets, drummers and ways to mic it and rooms you can mic it in and styles to put it in. It's, I mean, there's, there's some people who are like, oh, I've got my perfect system. I'm like, for everything? That doesn't seem like that's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> no, like maybe a general approach for a specific kind of thing. Like, oh, right. I'm going for rock. I'm going for roomy kit. I'm going for crazy metal, whatever. Then or you have even what setup works the best for your room. I'll also take yeah, that, right? That too. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. Actually, I just ran into a problem with some drums I just recorded where... I was like, oh, this will be fine. But I didn't, I forgot that he had a tiny kick drum and it sounded so big and full in the room. But now listening to the mic, it's like, there's, that's tuned pretty high. There's not as much beef. And I guess the bass is doing the low, low stuff this time. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> but actually that's one of the things for the Jesus County stuff I've been messing with is drum doubling. Oh, interesting. Well, so in 2012, I did this project called uh, Crab Cat. And Crab Cat was, I, I kind of fell in love with like lo-fi hip hop and synthwave stuff. Nice. <laughs> Just because I'm a huge, I'm a huge synth nerd and, you know, lo-fi hip hop. Like there's a certain, I think part of me loves like the aesthetic. It's nice. It's not, because I also used to be a huge ska fan. Okay. <laughs> but that can be a little bit abrasive right? Sometimes you just want like music that will just go and hold you and scratch your head and tell you that it's going to be okay. And so <laughs> lo-fi hip hop definitely fills that niche. Um, but the, but I was like, what if I combine those two genres? So I got the help of my friend Dylan Schweitzer and we ended up putting out like, I think 50 tracks that year, a little over. Wow. <laughs> because we were able to go and kind of uh, assembly line the process a little bit. Right. And they're, and it's not like they're all super serialized. It's not, you know, the same song 50 times or like slight variations. It's, you know, they're all different things, but we ended up just going, I, I have this little sequencer I used and I went and recorded all the, uh, I, I would basically go and brainstorm ideas on that every morning. So make like right. just one, you know, 16, 32, 64 bar loop, whatever, you know? And then I would go and throw the MIDI from all of those into my computer as well as the stems, like, and which takes what, 20 minutes, maybe once a week, or we had like 10 banks. So I would just go and do 10 of them, bounce them. Anyhow, then I'd shoot all of those over to Dylan. And then he would go and pick through all the way, all the bounces of them be like, which ones do I like? Mm. He'd choose his favorite one. And then once a week, he would go and make a full arrangement out of starting from one of those loops. Nice. And because it's lo-fi, it's not like it's super duper complicated. He definitely went a little, He no, actually he went above and beyond with that because his main thing is he's a film composer. Cool. So he was, yeah, so he was trying to go and make techno, right? Right. Um, and so then he would send that back to me and I would take the arrangement he made and bounce all the MIDI out 
through my uh, my synths and then design patches for all of that and make a make more of a texture and then run those through like different gu guitar pedals and stuff and effects nice. outboard things just trying to get like a unique fingerprint on this and then i just go and mix it master it put it online there we go bob's your uncle <laughs> nice yeah that's interesting there's so like i think that example with lo-fi or some forms of electronic music um different parameters than recording a whole band right like like it would be tough to record 50 songs of a rock band um because there's so oh, many right. different parameters right versus something in the box or that sequencer and you're collaborating mm -hmm. it maybe lends itself easier to do that kind of thing which is interesting well it's it's a whole different i i don't know i've thought about I'd like to think about like production, like kind of production flow being mm -hmm. like horizontal or vertical production, right? Right. Like you, you go and subtract 50 years from now and there's only horizontal production unless you're like, you know, Prince. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like you, you have to go and record each instrument at the same time or individually, but it's all linear, right? Yeah. You write the song, you arrange the song, you record the song, yeah. right? Then you mix the song and then you master the song, but you don't hear that final kick drum until you're mixing the song. But nowadays, there's no necessary reason to do that. You can you could start by making the final kick drum. You could just it will it could sound like it will on you know on Spotify from Go if you want to. It yeah. all just depends on the restrictions you put on yourself. So. But yeah, I think that's one of the things that made that process a lot easier is really embracing that. Being like, we're going to build this in the box. We're going to write it in the box pretty much. Yeah. Well, that's it's interesting because that's actually something that I talk quite a bit about is like intentional limitations. Like so mm, again, yeah, in contrasting yeah. with your your um with whoosh, whoop Sorry if I forgot the band name. Oh, whoosh. 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 Although we like to we like to mess with people with how to, what to call it. I think uh <laughs> like maybe French like a oh, whoosh. Shit. A whoosh shit. <laughs> I like that one. Uh but like that one where it's more open and experimentation is like an ethos. But with with yeah. your uh side lo-fi project with your friend, it's like, "Oh, okay, I'm using this specific sequencer." Like if it's a, a subharmonic con or whatever you have, and that's <laughs> that's the that's the parameters, right? You're like, "I'm jamming on this thing." every morning and then we're going to look at all the output and then we're my friends going to select the best ones and like that's like you're limiting the scope of how you're going to select ideas and how you're going to move forward in it and that can be super helpful to do something like finish 50 tracks right oh yeah well and, and it had a lot of great it had a, a lot of great things i learned from that especially technique wise and workflow right. wise right so one of the things one of the things that that really proved to me is how beneficial it can be to pass the baton because right. i feel like if you're trying to because i've tried to go and write and make a lot of music like i was saying in like 2020 i was able to go and finish a bunch of stuff and a good chunk of it was all me some of it i had help with friends but some of it was all me but the problem is i feel like it's e it's real easy to get stuck in the quagmire of indecision if you let yourself for a second right just kind of getting sucked into the tar pit and being like, well, I don't know if that's good. Or like I've had it where I'll just like record a hundred guitar parts in a row as I'm trying to write them on a record. Right. 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 And that's, it's, and it's like, I feel like in part, it's a little bit of a waste of time if you're doing it like that. But that being said, recording softwares are also excellent writing tools. Right. Mm. Cause then I can go and refer back to all those ideas. They're not just gone as soon as I forget it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, I think, I think that with uh, that you make a really good point that whereas if you're collaborating with somebody you have passing yeah. the baton or whatever it's like you have sort of a living mirror you have another source of consciousness looking at the thing and making decisions or, or some direction and when you're by yourself like I've been there so many times where you're just overwhelmed by the possibility and you're not mm -hmm. sure you don't have that objective perspective anymore and you almost need maybe more of unintentional process where you're just recording a bunch of stuff then reviewing it later and then you're like forgetting about half the stuff you made and then the stuff that sticks out you go with that and like something so that you can yeah. keep some objectivity on what you're working on because otherwise the you're just objectivity like, yeah the objectivity is everything though right? yeah like and that's that's the thing I, I found out and it was especially in that example i was talking about with crab cat um that was what i like it was just so blatant because of the approach right because i had written i'd written all of these tunes like so many so many little tiny snippets of music but by the time any of them came back to me 
I had completely forgotten about them. I and it, it was almost like um like a, a sense of like a, I didn't have that sense of attachment, right? Exactly. And I feel like it's anxiety that comes from that sense of attachment to the art you're making, which is also a good thing, right? Because if you're completely detached from it, you're not going to rep it or hype it as much because you don't, you know, your heart's not bleeding for it. But on the flip side of it, then I get to have it back and it's no longer mine. I'm working on something for someone else. It's someone else's thing I'm working on so I can look at it fresh, right? Totally. And you can also like, if it's a good balance to have, like when you're really feeling something, it's like, that's a sign that like, Hey, maybe there's something here, but also being detached enough to not listen to a loop like 30 million times and then not know <laughs> where to go or how to change it. And like, if you revisit something later, like if you make something and then you forget about it, you make a, a 10 other things, you come back, you might have more of an intuitive, just oh, I think this is what this needs. And you'll have a little bit more of a distance to be able to see it more accurately, as opposed to right. like, I can't not hear this the same way I've been hearing it for a thousand times, right? Well, and that's, yeah, that's something like, I don't know, I feel like the industry is kind of wrought with some of that. And I deal with that with recording clients all the time. Like it's one of my, it's one of my least favorite pet peeves when someone comes in and it's like, I want it to sound like that. And they give me a specific example or right. they want something similar to blank, but they want it to be more similar than us copyrights allow. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, or it, it, I, for a little bit, I was trying to get into like sync licensing and that stuff, which I'm glad I didn't. Cause that happens to be one of the, I am pretty sure that one's going to be on the chopping block for AI at like, yesterday yeah. like that's generic bumpers and background music that like and what they'll give you on the front end is we're like oh i want we want something that sounds like this generic piece of music from these three commercials or like three different ones and that's just what ai is for it does that so good exactly yeah <laughs> uh, look at people... all those things and be like there you go there's something soulless you can put behind your uh, arby's commercial yeah they call it so, uh some people call it wallpaper music which i agree oh yeah right? i love that <laughs> and uh yeah like that's it's such an interesting discussion because i do feel like yeah like we could go there for sure but um that like the, <laughs> the, the, the the ai revolution whatever it also like the silver lining in it is that i do feel that more original unique human thought human creativity will be lifted up because that's the sort of thing that AI can't really replace, right? Like something that sounds like X is like very easy to do. Something that sounds like experimentation of where human consciousness will take X thing. It's like, oh, that's a little harder. Right. <laughs> no, I, I well, and or at least for now. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit on the, I, I, I hate to say pessimistic side, but like the side of, I don't think there's anything special we can do with our brain jelly that can't be replicated i just think we have a very unique blend of stuff but it's a bunch of like in, it's almost like a, a bunch of individual applications that we just keep being able to replicate the effects of right just like how not animals have the same stuff up top right right even though we think they do like we look at a cat or a dog and we just like totally personify them but they have like what maybe like a 60 percent overlap with what we got going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's some similarities, but we're pretty different, I would say. But then they also look at you like you're stupid half the time. They're like, yeah, well, what's we are. What's even well. going on? <laughs> well, that's true. We are big dumb cats. <laughs> <laughs> Conclusion. <laughs> we're really bad at being cats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, we work it. that's way too hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're trying way too hard to be cats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just be humans. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, the other thing I, because uh, we were talking about just some of the crab cat stuff I learned. And one of the big things I learned from that project was drum doubling and samples. Mm, cause, yes. cause it was the lo-fi hip hop thing. And like most hip hop producers worth their salt, they're not just having one kick drum sample or one kick drum sound. Nowadays you're getting that fullness from like three different kick drums happening at the same time, covering the whole frequency spectrum in a unique way. Right? Totally. Yeah. Right. And that's how you get that punch. That's how you have your cake and eat it too, by having more cakes. <laughs> Just three cakes. <laughs> exactly. Then you have one for later too. <laughs> if you decide to go and have your cake and eat it too again. So there's, um, so that's cool. But I've started to use that stuff in Jesus Coyote. I was, and also I, I found this really cool. I shelled out for this nice plugin by XLN audio, I think called XO. Okay. 
Cool. But Never it's heard of it. it's like a well, it's a sample manager, a sample okay. yeah library manager. But it organizes everything based on how they sound. Cool. In like a colorful three-dimensional kind of nebula looking thing and that you can just go fun. and drag your cursor across and hear all of them Ooh. so no more going through folders upon folders of sample packs and stuff it'll just aggregate all of them and group them by tone it's just doy of course so like that perfect application of ai but i have been using that in combination with drum doubling for the drum parts i'm playing in jesus coyote especially for like snare and kick right to get something like a little more crunchy and a little more like in your face and aggressive. Yeah, totally more unique. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. It's uh that's a very more intentional way of filtering samples is by tone uh, than just by name. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I want, I want definitely sample starts with a, for yeah, sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> That's funny. Well, the the other weird thing I've been doing like that is uh, recording, reamping guitars through like a bunch of different amplifiers at once or separately, cool. and then going and blending all those different tones. Nice. I was That's gonna fun. say, have you ever have you ever kind of found that it's really difficult to go and replicate like the sound of one the sound of a guitar going through an amp in a room? Um, yeah, we'll actually have this thing called a torpedo digital load box by, um, two notes and it acts like a oh. cabinet load, right? So you, you have your amp head oh. and you crank it as if you're going to a cab, but it acts like the load. And then you have uh, cab sims on that thing and I could get some pretty close sounds. Like it's the same essence, the same like harmonic bouquet and right. like it sounds like it's in a room. Uh, so that's the closest I've gotten, nice. but sometimes like. I'm totally cool with like not sounding at all. Like it's a, a guitar amp normal, right? Like I'm happy to experiment if, if uh, that's what it, it needs. Right. I've been, I have been downright tempted since recording the whoosh project yeah. to put in some dry electric guitars. <laughs> just straight up DI dry. <laughs> yeah. We just, well, cause we DI them cause we're going to reamp and I was using right. some software emulations, but then I took some of those off because for, especially for some of the stuff we do a lot of like jazz harmony. Cool. And so it's a bunch of like really complicated, crunchy stuff. But some of it, I was like, that just sounds good. <laughs> huh. I was not expecting that. Um, yeah, no. The, well, I guess the thing that the, the thing about like the guitar amp in a room thing, I, and I've been nerding out like real hard about this concept. It's just something I keep picking at because so guitar, like people recording guitar, it sounds great, but it is a specific version of how a guitar amp sounds. Right. Because it is like almost like one or two points on a speaker, right? Yeah. Or sometimes you'll throw one in the back. Sometimes you do a distance one, but it is always like one fixed point in a guitar or one on a guitar cab. On the thing. Yeah. On an instrument that's radiating sound in 360 degrees and a sphere from it in different ways, and then bouncing off of all the surfaces in the room, colliding with some of those frequencies that it was putting out and canceling them out and amplifying others. And then some of them even hitting your guitar and changing how that sounds. And it seems like way too complicated of an equation to be able to easily replicate with one microphone or even in a software emulation of like, even if you do a really good job doing a convolution guitar amp, right? Like a right. Kemper or something like that. It's still, you know, you are still working with a very conventional way of doing it, which hasn't, I don't think that's really changed much since what the fifties. Yeah. Right, like that strategy is basically identical. So that's one thing I'm trying to, one area I'm trying to look into right now is more of the, um, oh God, what's it called? It's the, I want to say Sensophonics, but that's not even close. Oh, it's, it's like, v, like VR audio. Yeah, Ambisonics, like, Ambisonics, yeah. Ambisonics. that's it. Go. Getting that 360 replication, especially in headphones with like just the binaural and the head tracking stuff nowadays. Totally. Yeah, yeah, you, can get, you can get close to that with like I've I've heard people where they'll just stereo mic a band in a room, and it's like that's probably the closest you can get to what it would actually be, right? But even have... but even still, well, yeah, getting especially if you get like, you, have you seen the fake the fake head recorders? Those are fun. No, I haven't. That sounds hilarious. Oh, they put they basically make a a big they just make a rubber head, and then put a capsule in each ear. Nice. And then when you listen back to it, it sounds very strikingly close in headphones. I know everyone's surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but the but like you had head tracking to that and like a full spherical model, like with Dolby Atmos and things like that. And then you get just like a whole new dimension of what you can do with it. So that's the that's the thing that my sights are set on right now. Of course, I have to go and carve out the time in my schedule to learn it. So yeah, yeah, that's another deep rabbit <laughs> Which hole. Which requires <laughs> any of those albums to be finished first. <laughs> So yeah, finishing albums, like you on top of being in these three bands, and it sounds like you're doing guitar stuff, you're doing drum stuff, like you mentioned, which is awesome. We can oh, talk and about yeah, that and some then, more. And then for Woosh, I have my three tiers of keyboards. Three tiers of keyboards, so synth So Lord. many tiers, just yes. sobbing, yeah. Just... <laughs> and uh, you also run a studio, right? Yeah. So yeah, so like, tell me a little bit more about your studio. Um, So my studio... So I've been recording people for a while, but this is the first year I've really been in business doing studio stuff. Okay. I mean, this year year being 2022, right? Right. So I've been doing it since pretty much the start of 2022. I've done all my preparations before that. But yeah, that's kind of, I had, I was recording on the side and doing bands and doing a lot more uh, music lessons teaching right. before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit and that job, uh, Basically, that studio said, okay, we're going to see what happens. And then they just proceeded to not pivot. <laughs> <laughs> the guy just kind of threw up the towel, and he had all of my students from there on his computer. So I think I only managed to salvage, like, one. Oh, damn. Right. Damn. Right. So anyhow, I was kind of jettisoned for the, uh, for the bulk of the pandemic, but it also gave me time to regroup. And so then in 2021, I'm like, you know what? I'm doing it. The studio is the way to go. So I ended up, so that's how that kind of happened, or at least being like, I'm going to give this a shot. I know a bunch of studio owners and they don't seem like hyper enamored with the business, but you know, there's probably room for one more. <laughs> right. So yeah, I did, did that. Um, my studio is pretty modest, but it's very nimble. I have uh, was it my control room, which I'm up here for. And then I have my dead room downstairs in the basement. Nice. With a nice, lovely studio snake and umbil umbilical cord connecting the two. So. Oh wow! Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I that one's just super loaded up with installation panels I've built. Um, same thing up here, but like a little less because I wanted like a little more room sound. Right. And honestly, I have been gravitating away from that dead room more and more with recording stuff. Really, like just going super in the loud room. Yeah. Well, some of it, even vocals, yeah. uh, banjo I was recording up here recently, acoustic guitar, just because I'm starting to be more in, I don't know, reverb is on, my, my crosshairs are on reverb recently, just, it's hard, I find it hard to get a reverb I like. Yeah, reverb's tough, uh, unless you're going for like totally digital experimental stuff. But if like a real sounding right, right. reverb, like, yeah, I would agree Something with that. Something that's like really, because like there's plenty of stuff that's really convincing, but not when you, I feel like not when you compare it to the actual experience of being next to the instrument, right? Yeah. Or playing the instrument. And that's what I've been trying to figure out with um, having recording more stuff up here with light deadening instead of heavy deadening is do I like it any better? And for some stuff, absolutely. I think it's the thing I was talking about before where the sound bounces off of everything and then interacts with the actual sound of the instrument and the sound coming from the instrument. And you just get a way different result. Right. Especially with drums. Holy shit. Like, I had no idea how bad or like how much the sound of a drum was the stuff the drums were bouncing off of. Oh, dude. Yeah, like whenever i tr like a dead room versus like a live room and getting some good room <laughs> mics it's like you're like what the hell it's such a different thing uh when you get to the mixing stage it's like oh that's how all those rock records sound massive and it's like the snare's like it's because they have those rooms right <laughs> oh, well and i was actually i got to record an album like that back in like 2015 um and that one was i was friends with this art gallery up uh north of us and they uh, they let me use this big gallery room they have, which is super cool because it's like a it's all drywall, some carpet, some sheet metal for the ceiling, but there is only two surfaces in the entire thing that are parallel. So you only get like and they're like at either end of this kind of hall, and the place is built like a giant trapezoid, and the roof is angled too. <laughs> so like the sound goes forever, and you don't get any of the weird flutter from it either. 
So I recorded drums in like the skinny end of it and then set up like a distance mic all the way at the other end. And it sounded massive. And then I realized in the mixing process that I didn't really need that other mic out there because all of the reverb was inescapable. (laughs) <laughs> it was just baked into everything and uh, apart from like noise gating there was nothing i could do about it <laughs> and nice. so then uh, and, and that's when i was like dead room time gonna do dead room and now i am back being like well maybe in the middle somewhere maybe <laughs> yeah maybe some reflection so it sounds like the drum kit is loud but like not so many to uh <laughs> take up like 80 percent of the space in a mix <laughs> Yeah, definitely. You don't want to paint yourself in a corner too much. Like, especially yeah. like depending on the drummer and the, the sound, like it can be trashy sounding like so much stuff. And then you're like, oh, uh, you're just fighting that the whole time. So the control part is nice as well. But having live essence can be very nice as well. Yeah. So let me ask, let's let's back up a little bit. I'm curious. Okay. How did this how did this start? Like, how did you get into music? And then how did you get into recording? In what order was it together? Was it so band? I started uh I started getting into like I've I've been I've been doing music for a while. I got started in, like piano lessons when I was a kid. Right. Um and the, well another thing was that my parents both worked at the Bristol Renaissance Fair and would have jam sessions with the musicians from the fair on their porch like every weekend till I was oh, 10. Dope. Right? <laughs> That's sick, yeah. So I think it kind of set me up for this because it's made it's always made music like super attainable. Right. It was just something that you could just do. It's whatever, right? Right. So it was never like put on a pedestal. Nice. It's just a, it's part of reality. It was just like, yo, dude. That's yeah. Sick. So I did So I did like choir stuff in school and piano lessons. And then I became a percussionist through like the school band program. And then I, then we found out that my piano teacher also taught pipe organ. And so I did like a, like a three year, four year stint playing pipe organ in middle school. And then I quit piano lessons because I didn't like it anymore. Cause it was all, I did like the standard classical roster. Right. And at that point, it took me maybe like half a year to figure out, oh, wait, I really like music and I can't quite stay away from instruments, but I really like it when I'm doing whatever I want to do with it. And then right. I had been drugged through so many years of piano that I had like chops. Right. So I had gotten over the biggest hurdle, which is just being bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, or at least yeah. what I thought was the biggest hurdle of being bad. I was still bad then. <laughs> um, but then I spent high school just desperately trying to get people to jam with me and make bands and then just picking up whatever instruments my ADHD ass wanted to at the time (laughs) and then putting them down as soon as I got bored with them or found another shiny. And, uh, but it was at that point when I started getting into the recording, because as you probably know, you know, plenty of people get into recording by being in a band and being like, we need to make like some recordings so we can show people our stuff and book any amount of gigs <laughs> definitely yes <laughs> let alone even sell those cds and this is make it man that feels old because cds yeah. were still all, like they were still pretty relevant for sure yeah totally just barely like they were on their way out but they weren't gone yet they were still yeah, doing, it was on like, the a down nice slope mid- but it was still a slope right. <laughs> they were they, their hand wasn't even on the doorknob yet they were still putting their coat on in the yeah. foyer yeah um so yeah, so I did that, and then um, I ended up going to school for uh, first. Yeah, I went to go, I went up going to school for like recording and music business. Uh, oh, cool! After high school, so down at Milliken University. Very cool. In Decatur, Illinois. It is <laughs> smells like dog food when it rains. <laughs> so that's the that's the best thing I can say about that place. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there was some. I, I got to learn from some awesome cats down there. Uh, but it was kind of a weird spread of audio teachers. Gotcha. So they had, so their their junior most most junior faculty was Matt Talbot from this uh, this space grunge band called Hum. Okay. And they were and yeah, he's fantastic. They they were like they were pretty successful, but it you know it was definitely more niche stuff. But they got like to like Letterman and that sort of thing. So he was in like a pretty successful touring grunge band. Nice. But then he was he was teaching copyright law and things like that because he had had to go and deal with major label stuff and <laughs> right. So, and he was he was fantastic. He actually owns an all analog studio down in Champaign, Illinois. Wow, cool. Or right by it. Yeah. 
it's pretty it's pretty neat but the um the other guy was dr dave and he was definitely kind of renaissance man style you know he was a berkeley brat in the 70s gotcha <laughs> uh and he did um he did like some film scores and a bunch of session player work for a while and had a doctorate and so you know he was pretty cool and he, i learned a lot of production stuff from him but the, the craziest cat I got to learn from was this guy named Ronnie Dean, who retired right when I graduated. And he was a he was the chief engineer on the Johnny Cash show when that was happening. Whoa. So this guy cool. is just he's, and he's just an audio engineer. He is not a musician in any capacity. Just an audio dude. <laughs> just Well, just an audio yeah. dude. He doesn't think of notes. He thinks of frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, and, and specifically from the day where you had to know more of the electrical engineering behind stuff and how right, to fix them. Yeah. 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 Like, cause, because because when he was there, part of our coursework was this booklet of just like old school signal flow diagrams for wow. like, and here's how, I think it was an ACN or something. Oh, God, I can't remember the name, but it was like the little funnel that goes and combine, combine stuff when you bus or mix things. I was like, wow. <laughs> That knowledge has not been useful at all to me recently. <laughs> and right, other things I didn't learn, the other things I didn't learn there was how to use a synthesizer or how to go and synthesize tones, right, uh, or any of that stuff, which seems in hindsight to be incredibly short-sighted. But you know, that's how yep. that's how it goes. Like that's the trouble with going to any like institution for education in an industry that is constantly growing is that whoever is teaching you will be able to give you a slab of information and it'll be a lot of good information you'll have way more context and a robust foundation for what you learn later but you are not going to get a comprehensive picture you're not even going to get an up-to-date picture you're not even going to get a mildly like antiquated picture you're going to get a severely antiquated picture no matter how you cut it because the people who are on the bleeding edge of the industry are too busy working and making money and surviving I, well said absolutely <laughs> i i can speak from experience too like i went to audio school and learned a ton and like there's a certain amount yeah. of fundamentals like training your ear understanding signal flow understanding yeah. processors of oh, sure like that's that's timeless and foundational but like you said like really quick like it changes so fast that whereas like me learning pro tools and how to record like a live session is like become less and less relevant over time right where it's like now it's like oh maybe uh content creation and making a beat and like how to hook a listener is you know what I mean? like it's so different right um although i do i do like to record live band like stuff live out of spite sometimes well it's, yeah, it's still it's still amazing right like well it's, it's still cool but it is not the most efficient way to do it unless the band you're recording is tight just like tight as a black hole right <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so i'm curious like when you went to school which yeah, was yeah. right out of high school which is awesome did you have intentions of like running a studio like was that one part of the reason why you decided to go there or was it more like uh, i'm not sure but i know i love music and audio so i want to learn more about it where was your headspace at so it was kind of it's actually kind of funny because in some ways it's come full circle so I, in high school, all I, because people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, you have any idea, right? right. Like, Ex like you, like, you know what a good choice is there. And then you <laughs> follow your passion. And people are like, oh, no, not like that. <laughs> You're not talking about your passion. No. <laughs> well, I remember I even had a bandmate who was kind of like that, who was, who was, and I was like, what, you don't want to do this all like full time? And he's like, no, that would be an <laughs> No, I want to have like a house and probably kids and stuff. This is no, I'm not going to be in a band. <laughs> and to me, I just I had no I like I was so I was so dumbfounded. Like, what? What do you mean? It just didn't make any sense to me. Right. Of course, I was, you know, I, I'm even more cynical now. And I was pretty cynical back then. But the uh, oh, but no, I wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to do music yeah. for a living. And I was like, going to do that. And then in home, not home ec, consumer education, right? Which is a weird name for a class, first off. But <laughs> it's like, because that's all we are. We're just consumers. We just need to be educated to be more profitable consumers. I don't know. But the we had to go and choose like a future career and then make a budget for how to go and live off of that money and stuff. And I chose a music producer. Because I was like, cool. oh, that sounds cool. I'd do that. Um, well, and then I went to school and I... Uh, 
did like a bunch of session musician stuff and did a bunch of audio engineering and songwriting and producing. I got like the full liberal arts music-y package thing, right? Um, and so then I got out of school with all of this experience and all these different like hats I could wear and proceeded to try all of them on until they didn't fit anymore I didn't, or I found them to be scratchy and uncomfortable. Like audio engineering. I find my, I, I feel like I am an excellent audio engineer. However, I do not want to do live audio work because it's just like being pulled through a trough of shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quote of this podcast. <laughs> it's just... no, well, I agree it's with like you. It's a different well, vibe. It's a different vibe. Because everyone knows grumpy old sound guys. Yes. And But no one knows how they got that way. Because <laughs> they all started as young, enthusiastic sound guys, I'm pretty sure. And then it just got perpetually burned out and beaten down and and uh, Karen, I guess, until now they're just... <laughs> yeah, I, Car Car I think Karening someone is a verb. That's a verb now. Yeah, it's a verb now. <laughs> yeah, to be Karen'd. Um, but yeah, they just keep going and getting shit on until then they're just super grumpy and apathetic. They have the uh, let let God sort them out mixing technique. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they'll be all Set right. Set it to unity, walk out of the room, just... <laughs> So yeah, so that one that one was kind of a bust. I did that for a bit, um, and it's kind of fun. But I started to see like, oh no, this is gonna get real old real quick. Yeah. So then I, well, I think it was actually there was a Chicago there was a Chicago event company I was doing some uh, sound work for, until I realized I was being paid very little money to effectively just go and do warehouse moving stuff, just because I knew how to wrap cables, right? Right. <laughs> and they had me get there at noon and I didn't get home until noon the following day. And Red Bull can only take you so far. Um, yeah. And I, I was like, okay, I'm not making enough money to make this worth it. But yeah, that was also my early 20s. So, right. Um, but yeah, so I did that. I did a lot of, the, I did, and I still do do some teaching and have some private students. And that's cool. But more and more, I found that I really liked the recording aspect of it and the, the producing specifically. Like, yeah. recording's great. I like recording. It's kind of, there's a fun flow to it. It makes my brain happy and excited. But producing specifically, when I can go and, like, if I get the scent of something or I can go and make something really cool happen or get a performance out of someone that they didn't even know they could do and I didn't even know they could do sometimes. <laughs> that's that's the that's the stuff that i i live for that that's fantastic the same thing with same thing with songwriting too i do really really like songwriting for a lot of the same reasons totally yeah there's yeah. there's the creative input there right whereas audio engineering is a little bit more technical job right it's, it has parameters it's not as creative there is some creativity to it but it's a but little bit different there's also incredibly non-creative ways to do audio engineering this or is true. applications like I was doing meeting support for a while at this uh, corporate conference center, right? Which is like g giant, giant corporations have their training events, and they need someone to run a soundboard for like a microphone they pass around in the room, or the mic of the presenter in a small classroom. And I, funny enough, I actually found that I was really bad at that job <laughs> because it was so easy and unstimulating. You're like, I'm going to just add some saturation and delay to this vocal. And they're like, no, oh, I wish Stop the it. problem was, is I would just keep getting distracted. And then when I had to, it was like, okay, wait for 45 minutes and then press one button. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I'm just like, okay. And then like, you know. 30 minutes later on my laptop after like playing video games or like, no, and out like that 45 minutes comes by. And then I'm just like, they're like, excuse me, the PowerPoint. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, not my, not my strong suit there, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So re recording, doing studio stuff, definitely, definitely pretty nice, but it's funny. Cause I also ran into the same limitations for like doing more generic music stuff. Or like mm. musician stuff right right like all the background music gigs or things cover like cover bands yeah and yeah. like nothing wrong with nothing wrong with cover bands but i think to really be able to persevere through that to a level where it's the where it gets good you really have to love the performing aspect of it you have to 100%. love you have to you have to get a large amount of satisfaction from being being on your shit and doing a good job Totally. Yeah. And like, even me, like I've done some cover shows and it's fun, but I like it did, it didn't scratch the itch that I was looking for. 
um i, w- I would i'd be much more pulled to create something to write my own material with the band or whatever right and like right oh and it's so demoralizing too when people because people just like remembering stuff <laughs> yeah people for like sure. remembering stuff way more than they like music yeah they're like oh didn't you do that cover show that was awesome right you should do it again and you're like no <laughs> like it was or fun even you but... could play a, you could play like an hour worth of outstanding original music that if the same people would have listened to on repeat in their car like you would with a cd for a while they would probably fall in love with but it does not necessarily make them as excited as that one song they knew from high school right yeah that's you can't that's beat that nostalgia that nostalgia yeah. is like like that's rooted that's a it's a yeah. pretty good hit that's yeah. like just you know t- <laughs> tie it off squirt that straight in you know you can't you just can't beat the chemicals you can't beat the chemicals that nostalgia gives people that's hilarious <laughs> that, that probably speaks to like a huge amount of like um popular music and venturing like using something familiar and and injecting originality within familiarity whereas somebody can still get the hit of Oh, like I know this vibe. This bring this makes me think of this, this, and this. But you're bringing something new in that thing instead of just being like, "We're going to space. Come on down." <laughs> right though. No, that's well. Actually, that's that's kind of a fascinating topic because hip hop is one of these genres that I think has pioneered that the hardest. But it it's um, gosh, it was some article I read a while back that was talking about timbre, like the individual actual sound of an instrument, right? Being a, having a way stronger connection to our emotions than any other aspect of music. That's an right. interesting proposition. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and then you think about it, and it's because of the nostalgia connection. Because if you play someone something, even just a single sound, a little sound bite, but it has the sonic characteristic of something that they were very familiar with and possibly love, then you get a whole different like you get a whole different reaction out of that and it doesn't matter what chords you are using what melody notes you're hitting Literally you know how the good sound. the production is yeah or yeah. even the lyrics right more important yeah. than the poetry that's for sure so that's one that's something same thing so all these samples get that but then you also look at like lo-fi and synth wave right right queuing off that same thing but in a more nebulous way right they're going and using extreme versions almost like a distorted memory of what the 80s was like <laughs> to go and make to go and make new stuff but it works it does the trick right it's nuts yeah same thing with uh well and same thing with a bunch of other genres right it's you could play the same piece of music but with a little bit of a like a little tweak to that guitar tone now it's a different genre right right yeah, that's funny. Like anytime, like now that you mentioned that, anytime I hear like like ninety late nineties drum production, like grunge age, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, right, right. It's just like, oh wow, like it has such, it just pulls you in. <laughs> it just has a pull to it, and it's just sound. Like it doesn't matter what the drum beat is. It's just the tone. No, not even right? a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's well, it, and, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I find that with a lot of stuff and. For like in good ways and bad ways, there's some there's some sounds and production styles that I am kind of repulsed by for the same reason, right? Yeah, like yeah, especially like traditional pop production, I tend to roll my eyes at a bit, just because it's do. kind of boring. You know, you can just pay enough money and make perfect stuff, right? Yeah, and perfect, like perfect is attainable now. <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I mean. There. Like perfect <laughs> is attainable and it's underwhelming. Like that's how I would say it. It's like oh yeah, great perfection. Huh. <laughs> you know like that's how, oh look it's, no it's more perfection it's, oh more perfection oh, great like you know what i mean it's just like uh it's interesting well um, and it used to be impressive right <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> it was impressive when it was impressive just <laughs> um so uh i'm curious about yeah. so with when i went to school um i've been playing in bands and like yeah i got some recording uh some recording experience and written some songs but coming out of high uh audio school I felt like I learned a, t- a ton of technical stuff, like processors, engineering principles, how to use Pro Tools, et cetera. Um, but I felt like I was lacking a little bit in the creative process, like how to mm, how to get ideas yeah. out and produce them. And like, if you wanted to write your own music, cause that was the North Star for me personally, was like, oh, I wanted to produce my own awesome records, like the stuff that yeah. moved me in the past. So I wanted to hear like, did, was it didn't sound like it was much of an issue for you maybe because of your past experience like growing up you were maybe already already writing music before you went to school or did you right. find it was an issue and then the side question to that is like 
Can you describe to me your creative process? <laughs> like, what does that look like in general? So, well, and you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. For me, a lot of the time, creativity is very, um, like, it's almost inescapable. Like, if I don't keep making stuff and doing things, then it starts kind of bursting out at the seams. <laughs> but that being said, it's also not without its fair sh- – because there's a bunch of people who could probably say similar things, right? I, I – has. I feel like most musicians and artists are kind of like that, where that's why they got into it is because their brain just does that. If not constantly, then at least a good chunk of the time, but it's trying to go and foster, foster that is really tricky. And for me, the actual, well, I've, I've gone through a bunch of different ways of doing it, but one thing I did when I was in college, which I think got me over that hurdle was something I called the thing in a day project where during i think it was the summer of my sophomore year i had just gotten my first macbook pro i just gotten logic because my uh my one of my audio professors dr dave burdick recommended that like because i was trying to figure out a keyboard rig and stuff and he's like nowadays you can just go and get main stage plug a midi controller into it and you're set and he wasn't wrong but the um the main issue with it is still that the processing power wasn't really up to snuff at that point, right? Right. You still have latency to work around, which makes you feel like you're playing music through a condom, which no one likes. (laughs) That's awesome. So I I was not a big fan of that approach then, but it also allowed me to really get a jump on recording stuff. And I had done some recording before that, but it had been like with Audacity or I had a bootleg copy of Reason 4 and uh, I had Crystal Audio Engine, which is just not is different Audacity that's slightly more stable, right? right. Um, but I had, I had even done like, I'd recorded a, a couple different film soundtracks for a friend of mine who was uh, going to film school, right? Which I, I was doing that with like a rock band mic and Audacity <laughs> back in like 2010. <laughs> So, you know, it's like I have gotten to this point where I'm at very linearly. <laughs> One piece of gear at a time. Yeah. Um, but when I got that MacBook, I was like, okay, I'm going to go and do a thing a day project. I was inspired by uh, Jonathan Colton. You remember Jonathan Colton? He was, about. Uh, he, well, he was like an old, he was like a singer songwriter from the earlier days of the internet. He was like okay. one of the first big internet famous musicians. Cool. Right. And he was like a coder who quit his quit his coding job to pursue his career as a musician. And he even had a wife and a kid that he was trying to support with it. And he had his own website, and which was also very well manicured because he was, you know, in Internet application coding. <laughs> <laughs> but he someone told him to go and write a song every week. Mm-hmm. And so he would write and put one out every week. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do that, but sloppier. And then. So I went and wrote, recorded, and put online a thing every single day of that summer of, like, 2012. Nice. Nice. Which which was aggressive. Um, and I did, I think I did, like, 98. Yeah, I did 98 well things just to be, because I, I, like, I kind of like upsetting things sometimes. Like, I think 98 is a pretty upsetting number because you were almost at 99 or 100 and you just didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> like I could have, but didn't. <laughs> it felt like the perfect stopping point. Um, but what I found in the, well, and also, um, you know, big disclaimer, most of the stuff I made in that thing a day project was hot garbage, mm-hmm. wholesale garbage. But there were some good things that came out of it. Things I even used for like some later releases. And the one of the big things I found that that got me was way more comfortable and familiar with um with using logic and op- logic and operating it right mm-hmm. going and just the general workflow is just a good amount a lot of practice in just some of the nuts and bolts and the basics but the other thing i noticed is that that subsequent fall after that i had a songwriting class in millican and i was um i i was i put out some stuff in that songwriting class that's some of the favorite tunes I had ever per, like ever written at that time, because it's almost like going and forcing myself to create constantly mm. went and strengthened those muscles in my brain so that when I actually did get inspired by something, I was fit and ready to run with it. Right. And I could run farther with it. Sometimes I used to have this problem where I'd get inspired and I get an idea uh, and I'd get like one verse and one chorus into it and then be done. 
it's like, like the verse two problem. It's like, well, I don't know what to do with verse two. My brain <laughs> belched out all this good stuff, but I'm not sure where to go from here though. And I'm also, I also, another bottleneck I have in my creative process is, um, what was it? It is coming back to works that I've started, right? If I right. didn't finish something in the first go or the first sitting, I have a hard time coming back and finishing it later because I'm just not in the same headspace or something. I don't know. Maybe it's just unappealing. Maybe it's just me not liking leftovers. But the, <laughs> but the other thing that I have a hard time and I get bottlenecked on is revising my material. Right. Because frequently I will go and do it one way and then I will go and be like, oh, that's good enough and then try to record it instead of like maybe workshopping a couple things that weren't the best or, you know, going and polishing it up a little more. Right. So, but one of the things I really like about being in a band is that it gives you an opportunity to go and workshop material over and over and over again, especially if you're playing it live. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's the, well, and that's kind of another interesting creative thing I noticed, right? So there's like, you can go and work out to go and get some creative mojo flowing. Mm -hmm. But I have found that by far, creativity only happens when you're kind of in a play state, which is why people get into writer's block, because they get too serious about it, and they get a little bit too in their head about it, and they stop having fun, and then dries up, dries up like the desert, that tap is closed. You forgot to pay the water bill. There's nothing. <laughs> but but then if you're having fun, having a good time, and there's no pressure for it to be perfect or even good, then you'd be amazed what just flows out endlessly. You can't even stop it at that point. And yeah. it's also – well, it's also funny because I can – being in doing the three bands thing, I can go and kind of compare and contrast because they're all – we all do group writing by right. and large like sometimes we'll come in with like a semi fleshed out idea or even a fully fleshed out idea and then it's just arranging but for the most part we're writing a lot of we're doing a lot of collaborative writing so some of the some of the groups that have that or the or the groups that are really good at fostering and maintaining that play state those ones easy effortless the groups that are a little more critical of what we're trying to go for and what we need at the end of it and trying to go and get it to sound good and right. Choke points, nothing like pulling teeth, like, uh, like trying to shit out diamonds. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's a little, little bit more painful it can still happen, but it's just a different process. Mm -hmm. Although the, the, the other thing I was taught in audio school is like professional songwriters, they don't wait for inspiration. They just sit down and write a song. Yeah. You can just sit down and do that. And I think, so I, I don't know. I, I find my approach to creativity to be kind of a combination of the two being that when I'm inspired, when I'm in a good mood, when things are flowing, fantastic, run with it, try to keep, try to make sure that situation happens as often as possible. But in the event that you don't have that, then just make stuff that works. I don't know. Like going, like what word rhymes with June? Moon? There we go. Moon. Let's go and write something around moon. What do you, right. what are we trying to talk about with this? Let's go and engineer. Let's craft this. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be inspired. We can build a song like you'd build a house, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You can't, you not can going to be as potent, but you, know. you can create the conditions <laughs> or like create the games, right? Like any kind of prompt, mm. like, yo, man, like, can you do X, Y, Z about the moon with, I don't know, like a singing bowl that you have it's like, yeah, totally. Right. Like, cause you have prompts and limitations. Uh, there's a ton that you hit there that it's like the <laughs> nail right on the head. It's, um, it's like, I totally agree. There's a saying, um, that one of my mentors to told me, it's like, if you don't make crap, you're going to get constipated. Right. And like, it's that idea of <laughs> you want to be continuously showing up because like a lot of people, a lot of producers that I've talked to and like, aspiring musicians and artists they'll they'll get into writer's block they'll get into their head about it they'll get overwhelmed and a lot of it is because like they kind of have this weird relationship with just showing up and and being present and consistently creating right and a few things on that is that like for if you're learning if you're more in the beginning stages like the fastest way you will learn is to like practice making things and you're going to learn your software you're going to learn the theory you're going to learn how layers work together you're going to get better rhythm and there's no like amount of theory that will equal that practice and that experience <laughs> which is yeah. like a huge breakthrough and another thing you taught you touched on is the the kind of like 
if we want to get technical about it, is like the difference between divergent thinking and convergent thinking, right? And like, Ooh, okay, like, hit me. Okay, yeah. So like, we have you could think of it as different roles. Like, we have a creator role and we have an a, an editor role, right? And we have like all these different roles we play on the process. And it's extremely hard to create and edit at the same time. There, it's almost Can't like do it. You, Can't it's do like it. gas and break at the same time. You're like, oh, oh you can. Well, I, to be you, fair, you can do it. You can. However, you will feel the effects on your internal engine. Exactly. Like you'll feel <laughs> that it, it takes a lot of energy, and it's almost like you want to allow each of those states to ex expand themselves. So, like one thing that I encourage with like teaching, and that I've noticed in a lot of people with their process when they've done stuff like. 50 song ideas or they're just prolific in general is they have mm -hmm. time where they're only doing divergent thinking which is essentially exploring possibilities and playing and not concerned with if it's good or not not letting the quality judgments come in and just allowing yourself to explore and see what happens and be pleasantly surprised and it might be crap and that's totally okay but you might mm -hmm. discover something awesome and that's great because you probably would have made something you'd have never thought of an analytically in a zillion in a zillion years versus right. another step of the process is you can look at what you made and have quality judgments later. Like maybe you wait, you create something, you do something else, you come back and then you look at it and be like, you know what, this part is awesome. Maybe we can make it a little bit better or maybe this part doesn't fit. And like you can imagine, you can apply logic to it once you have something, right? Yeah. And then it's so much easier to just like keep the thing rolling instead of, right at the, at the beginning being like, I have to make something amazing and every single thing I do has to has to be awesome. And you're like creating this pressure and it just like, man, it kills you. <laughs> well, so I actually, a great application of that outside of songwriting is that's kind of how I deal with recording solos most of the time for clients as well as myself is I will have I will have them go and record as many as they want, right? Until they're satisfied with the amount of material we have. But I'll say, keep doing ideas, do new stuff, have fun, just do things. And then they'll go and do things that they find to be appropriate or not. And right. we'll like maybe five or 10 or 15 or 20, who knows? Who knows? Depends on how patient I am. But <laughs> but then we go and sort through, and hopefully they remember some of the ones that were their favorites, and we use those as kind of base takes for the solo. But then we'll go and just kind of poke around and see what we can put together, and then go and weave out of all the solos they did, we'll weave together a, like, a really, really cool solo. We'll weave together a very compelling performance out of all these ideas they brainstormed. And I feel very, uh, what do you call it? I feel I feel very justified in doing that because then you're just using a recording software as a writing tool, right? You're using it as a way to go and expedite the writing process while you're recording it. It's a it's a win-win, right? Some people get like, oh, it means I didn't, you know, I had to do all these edits, I didn't play it right, or I didn't they get in their head like that. It's like, no, 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 no. No, we are going and getting the best possible solo, or we're getting something incredible, this greater than the sum of the parts sort of thing. And you know who did that technique originally? David Gilmore of Pink Floyd had a whole tape machine just dedicated to making his solos. Oh, that's that's how they're so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, though. And so, I, and so I immediately, I just throw that one out there, and it tends to shut anyone up who has any complaints about <laughs> they're that. They're like, that's wrong. <laughs> unless, unless you got a written solo, I'm probably going to go and help you brainstorm and improvise one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, And it's also like... There, there's such limitation like don't be wrong like knowledge and theory and orchestration is fantastic but yeah. it has limitations like something about the spontaneous moment and like mistakes happy accidents and the culmination of those is like a fantastic way to write something right and it's like it seems like so much easier it's like hey just have fun for 15 takes and then let's look at it and see what's there and it's like instead of like i have to make the best thing <laughs> right off the bat it's just like oh man well in, in even even the concept of the best thing i think that one is just flown completely out of the window for me there is no best. there is no best thing it's an illusion there is no right? it's best it's just goods like things that are good or compelling or things that are fun like you just i don't know i'm i'm, I'm even less i'm even less concerned about things being good nowadays part of me likes to bunt things for fun because i think it's because i have fun with it <laughs> right it's like yeah that's a whole philosophical thing it's like well is something good if you enjoyed ex ex the experience of creating it of course it is well and also <laughs> something that's something has been nice about even though 
all the bands and uh, the studio and everything going. It's like, you know, time management. It's pulling me all sorts of different directions. It's hard to go and draw boundaries with all, everyone. But one of the one of the best things about it is that I have a bunch of outlets for the ideas I have. So I don't feel like if I don't get this idea into this project, it's gonna, it's just not gonna do anything. I have like a bunch of different avenues I can throw that into. So it's like there's less, there's less waste and I don't need to go and have all of the absurd chaotic ideas in, you know, the invisible cartoons stuff. I can go and save those for Jesus Coyote or whoosh or, you know, it's having like the right boxes to put stuff in. And I feel like that gets, that makes it difficult for some people who are trying to go and make a digital content brand because they end up going and trying to funnel all the things they want to do into something that needs to be concise and easily understandable. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, like, I think that's important to not overly be emotional if something doesn't fit. Like if, if this thing yeah. doesn't fit here, it's like, that's okay. You have other places that it can fit. And it's like, but if you only oh, one have of, one place, it's like, oh no. <laughs> one of my friends has a, uh, he's actually the lead singer of Jesus Coyote. We, we did we did a good amount of songwriting before that too, but he had a great quote, which is even a headwind moves the ship. <laughs> <laughs> which if any, anyone's not familiar with uh, nautical terminology, uh, sailboats, move with the wind <laughs> and if there is no wind they do not move so even a wind moving the opposite direction from where you want to go is still way better than having no wind <laughs> because at least you can use it to move the ship around and try to get in the direction you want to go but if you're in a doldrum and no one's having any ideas you're not making a song you know absolutely yeah it's all about that wind that flow Momentum, or the idea energy. might lead to something that is the right idea Oh man, that's that's the thing. Like a lot of people that I've spoken to, they they have a fear of coming up with bad ideas or like going in the wrong direction. But one thing that I've learned is that anything, whether it's a good, bad, right direction, wrong direction, can be the soil for the night for the potential idea eventually to be there. Right? Like any forward momentum, yeah. even if it's not in the right direction, could be the seed for the right answer. And you never know where that answer could be. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of it's just people being impatient and like not being good at separating the divergent and convergent thinking. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so I have a kind of a deeper, I have a couple questions I want to hit. Um, oh, go for, for it. sure. So this one's a little deep, but, or not deep. It's whatever you, you think. So what is <laughs> art? What does art mean to you in general? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. It's a thing. <laughs> no, I think, so it was funny because I the so I had a podcast for a little bit. We only did like one season, but it was called How Do Artists? And nice. the entire concept of it was going and exploring, uh, kind of trying to demystify the life of artists, musicians, what have you, right? Because you only see the monolithic presence of them online or in shows and things like that, or the tortured artist or the but artists typically have to be incredibly well put together. They are running their own business and they many of them have families they have to support too off of this. So people who are successfully being artists are not starving artists. They're not insane. They're highly competent and functional people who have found creative ways to kind of grow up through the cracks in the sidewalk. Right. Yo. So, <laughs> right though. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, it was a pretty, it was, a, it was a fun idea and I was doing it with um, my co-host Carlana, who is a visual artist. Cool. Um, and she actually also did some, she was in the recording industry for a little bit back when she was in, she was younger uh, in like the nineties with when like the house scene was popping off in Chicago and stuff. And anyhow, so she has crazy stories from that, but we had got into it about what guests we could have on and what, what we were counting as art. And she had a more traditional view of art and basically thinking art being visual art, music, theater. Those are art, right? So that includes sculpture, that includes 2D art, that includes a bunch of stuff. You know, cinema, uh, was it any film stuff can be art? Any, uh, what was it? Uh, video games are art, right? All those things were safe, but then culinary arts? Yes or no? Going and making, uh, designing flavors, is that art? Is like, um, you know, so it's landscape design, is that art? It's basically archaeology, not archaeology, <laughs> architecture, <laughs> yes. different arc. Um, 
Art, art. But the uh, so it, it got kind of in the weeds because I was like, hell, yeah, let's get there's so many microbreweries. Let's get some brewmasters on because they're creating these recipes for these works of art that are just beverages, right? Right. It also didn't happen that she didn't drink, so she was a hard sell on that in the first place. But <laughs> what I the more and more I talked about it, the more and more art. I mean, they say like arts in the eye of the beholder, and yeah, kind of though. I think art itself is it's tricky to talk about art because of how it's made and i think uh, a friend of mine hit it on the head really well saying that there is a difference between art and craft Ooh, yes i've heard this conversation and i, I like right and i like it because you know because art is like craft is the act like craft is how you make the art, right? Yes. If you are making art, but you don't have to make art with your craft. Exactly. And I would also conject that art is not a on off switch. It's not like this is or isn't art. I think it is definitely more of a gradient. There's mm. like, like there's powerful and less powerful art. And I kind of like a lot of the postmodernist thinking with that being that good art goes and has a strong emotional reaction and so better art has a gives people a stronger emotional reaction and the postmodern part is uh whether it's positive or negative doesn't matter right so if some if something makes someone obscenely angry and it's art or and it was well crafted in an artistic medium then probably art i'd call it art yeah i would too so <laughs> So, you know, that's Jackson Pollock, that's uh, Chuck Palahniuk, that's, uh, you know, that's a bunch of really gross stuff, very beautiful stuff, but that's also, uh, that's also shitposting on Facebook. So, you know, not a perfect definition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that was good, though. Like, some say that there's an art to everything, right? But there's also, like, I do agree that there's there's a spectrum, right? There's art and craft and they're connected but they're not always the same and like i don't know like there's the internal compass of art like if you move rocks around in a way that like makes sense to you in the hieroglyphs of your mind maybe it's art to you like and maybe it's just as valuable as someone else being like i don't know it looks like rocks <laughs> right like it's very hard to put down. Well, and I think, and I, I think the, the kind of the core of the art thing is that it's stuff that you yourself resonate with, right? Boom. Nail. And the head. my, uh, my other thought with that, and I think it's something that a bunch of people are still kind of getting caught up with, like at least paradigm wise, but the idea that if you find something to be very potent, there are enough people on the planet who are not so distinct who are who are just like you or at least similar enough to also love it and connect with it right like we're all more alike than we are different if social media and digital trends have taught us anything is that we are not so special like we are all special but just not that special right yeah for sure <laughs> we're all like intensely different but you just there are just a whole there are an entire income's worth of people on this planet if not in your state if not maybe even in your just general vicinity that would be that would absolutely love whatever you put out if you just go and make it very authentic right well said i couldn't agree more like <laughs> some people ask like how do i make music that other people will like or like how do you express xyz in, in music and it just gets so like subjective and ambiguous until and it, it always comes back to like to what you said it's like if you make something that you feel and you resonate with that's the best chance you have for other people to know, for, to feel the whoa. same thing. It's, it's like, like art hasn't changed in <laughs> forever. It's like, <laughs> whoa, full circle. <laughs> it's like, that's the thing that was, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's funny. Well, and that's the, I don't know. I think that's the, well, again, I guess the flip side of that is the funny part about it, right? Right. Is that trying to make stuff that appeals to the most people will make it appeal less even to those people yep even the sheepiest of the sheep <laughs> like, <laughs> like man you know, like, like... <laughs> and you know the only things you know the things that appeal to those people it's not necessarily the art and sometimes it's the nostalgia and the spectacle right or the status you know it's a bunch of things that you like unless you have a boat full of money you're not going to be able to give them anyhow right right so 
I don't know. That seems like the only reasonable model is to go and make stuff that is as authentic and wonderful as you possibly can, and then use the digital tools at your disposal to go and find as many people as possible who are enough like you to really love those things, and hopefully they're willing to hemorrhage money in your direction. Love it. Love it. That's great <laughs> advice. That's not, like, that's real talk, though. Like, real talk. Well, it's like, what other option is there, you know? Exactly. It doesn't even like, seem like there's another choice. <laughs> Exactly. Like, and I feel like all the other choices are just illusions of certainty over. And then you come back to the same thing. <laughs> oh, Talk about illusions of certainty. It's I, I feel like everyone's like always super guilty of uh, assuming they know everything. It's like our default state is assuming we have all the information when really anyone with half a brain could think about it just for a sec and be like, I have no information comparatively. <laughs> we know nothing. Oh, okay. That's, <laughs> and I'm okay with it. <laughs> effectively, effectively nothing. We yeah. know some things. It's just the amount of things to know dwarf it to the point of, yeah. Non-existent. <laughs> yeah. A uh, little bit. It, <laughs> awesome. So I usually like to wrap these up with like a thing that I may or may not have stolen from Tim Ferriss. Or it's Ooh, like okay. <laughs> uh, these rapid fire questions where they usually don't even end up being rapid fire, but I'm going to call them rapid fire anyway, where I just like, throw out a question to you and then you give me an answer and uh let's it's usually it. fun yeah all right so let's do it what would you say is the song or artist that you've shared most with other people i really wish you had stopped it what would you say <laughs> 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 what is the thing you would say just <laughs> what would you say but, uh, okay i've been sharing one of the ones i've shared a lot is a mefe no it's um sun spat by this band called a mefe okay which is like an afrobeat group and it's really cool because it does this crazy trick where it goes and jumps like a 16th note from where the horn line tells you the downbeat is and when the drums come into like a 16th note off you're like oh <laughs> it feels all weird <laughs> i love it i gotta check that out that's right up my alley yeah nice okay what are one to three books that have greatly influenced your life. Ooh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman is fantastic. It's made me hate people less, um, but it's talking <laughs> about a bunch of like heuristics and different brain glitches that we have. That's actually the one that I got the, we always kind of assume we know everything yeah. as a survival mechanism. Right. So there was that one. Um, Chuck Palahniuk has had a pretty big influence on me, just in general. So any one of his books, I think Rant is one of my faves, though. Nice. Um, then the other one is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, and that one is huge on like sustainability, totalitarian agriculture, how we've kind of been in this death spiral for a minute now. Right. Um, <laughs> it's the, you know just all of recorded history. <laughs> it's, it's just like, been yeah. a long time coming, you know. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's interesting times. <laughs> for sure um so yeah awesome my books great awesome um how has failure or apparent failure led to success like do you have a favorite quote-unquote failure like something that happened where you actually you're like whoa that was actually a good thing nope only tears wait no <laughs> <laughs> i only have a pile of tears no so the sorry. um uh <laughs> There is, yes, I mean, there's, it's, it's less like, is there one I can point to? And it's more like, there are almost countless examples of things that didn't go my way, or I didn't get accepted into something or someone didn't pick me up, especially when I was younger. And I was just tr jobbing, trying to go and get any gigs that I could join any bands I could right out of college. Cause it's like, I got, I got art school debt. I need to go and make money now with the art stuff. That's easy, right? I can just do that. That's fine. <laughs> Super easy. No, it happens to be that that's just, yeah, it's like trying to grow, grow a flower garden in an acid bath. Um, yeah, but no, I think there is, I mean, there's just like examples of bands I was working with or artists I was working with that I then fell out with. And then, but because that wasn't occupying my time, someone else came in and said, hey, let's do this. And it worked out great. So Awesome. Yeah, that's some, yeah. like sometimes like something yeah exactly like something leaving your life or something that seemed like oh man that's kind of sucked opens the space for the next thing that's supposed to happen maybe <laughs> well and it's the actually you know what here's a, here's a funny one it wouldn't uh i wouldn't have uh i wouldn't be in three bands right now if i didn't get burned by two bands that i was fronting 
blowing up in my face back to back. Wow. <laughs> Actually, yeah, no. There you go. Two, kind of three, basically just right in a row, just falling to pieces and exploding and then having to go and figure out, well, what do I do now? And then going and then now I'm where I'm at. And yeah. several of the members of those bands that fell apart, I'm still working with. So there you go. That's funny how it was like three that fell and then three more now. That's exactly that's hilarious. From, straight from the ashes, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Best sub $100 purchase you've recently made. I bought a lot of expensive things recently. <laughs> Just looks um, at his gear, at his studio, like oh. No, I just I'm I'm upgrading my keytar rig right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> to a uh, because there's no keytars on the market. There's just none. It sucks. But and I got burned by this new keytar company called Link. Don't buy from them. They're asshats. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, defamation. I don't care. They ripped me off. Well, they didn't rip me off, but they made me wait six months to refund my money for a pre-order. So. Lame lame is hell but no i'm doing i'm dealing with a keytar from the 80s because it was the best one for what i needed and a sound generator from 2012 and they don't like to talk and so i have to build a box to connect them but as far as you know what you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna show you oh he's getting it Oh, so I was uh, while recording the Woosh album, we were talking about uh, Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, okay. which is a delightful show. I yes. love that show. Um, so one of my bandmates got me this. Oh, damn. Which is like an old school Hanna-Barbera Birdman action figure. I want to go and get a little business suit for him. That's awesome. I feel like that would be funny. Yes. That's awesome. but and, and a yeah, bird garden studios. I got a lot of bird stuff, you know. Right. Add to the on. vibe. Get the birds. Add, add to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> Need more birds. <laughs> nice. So on the flip of that, what would you say is one of the most worthwhile investments you've made? And this can be like anything. It could be like time, money, a piece of gear. I mean, a bunch of investments in gear have panned out. A bunch of them haven't. But... um one of the most worthwhile ones definitely laptops and computers those are always really handy seeing as you know they're kind of the heart and soul of the setup right but you know what one of the invest uh the, my kind of three main keyboards actually you know what yeah all of the main keyboards i've been using for a while have all been tremendous investments like over here where i have uh what was it this uh, Key Lab 61, and that's been pretty nice. I got to say, it's the Mark II one, so they did a better job with the build quality. Nice. But having transport controls, faders, being able to do that stuff, and also play like whatever key lines I need at the time on there, it's pretty posh. It's pretty nice. Feeling it. The other two that tie for that, or three, so it's the, I got a Novation Summit, which is a delightful synthesizer I've been a big fan of for a minute now. Uh, my Korg SV1, which has done outstandingly well, aside from the fact that one of the B-flats is now rattly on me. Um, but seeing as I was, like, smashing my face and feet into it for a while, it's fine. It's fine. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fine limitation. Like, right without B-flat, please. But I do think the winner of that award goes to my keytar that I've been using for over a decade now. I think about a decade and a half at least, which is the Roland... Uh, AX09 Lucinia. Nice. Damn, I'm going to have and to get that you to do one... some guitar on a track. <laughs> oh, please. I would love to. The, uh, what was it? And it's it's held up really good, except I finally twisted the volume knob until it's starting to get crackly. Oh, dang. <laughs> right. And it's all like surface mounted stuff. So I'm like, I don't know if it's worth repairing that. I'm just getting a new one. Probably cost the same. Right. They've actually held price pretty well. I'm surprised. But it's little, it's compact. The cheesy sounds work for what I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah. Right on. That's that's <laughs> awesome. That's But I see what you mean about it not being so rapid fire. But yeah, bad advice that I had been uh that I've gotten in the past is or, Yeah, just bad advice in general for our Well, industry. it's there is a couple different things that I think of with when I hear that. The worst one of the worst ones is is that you just have to wait to be found, which is 
horrible. I think, and it, I, I'm just going to go and make a broader poke at that to be anyone who has like magical thinking about it. Like who thinks, oh, well, we're just going to do this. And then hopefully, and then, you know, you can just stop them right when they say hope, because hope is a terrible business model. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, pay your rent with hope. Um, but it's, I think it's important to go and think through all the steps from where you are to where you need to get to. And it's okay if you don't know all of them when you're planning. That's why you can do research, try to find data, or even just accept that you don't know some chunks and you're going to get there and see what happens. But to go and think that, okay, we're going to go and do all this stuff and then we're going to go and have done it and get and be successful and a label is going to find us or a management company is going to find us and give us a big silver ticket all the way up most of what i've seen has been that is for one not the case especially anymore industry revenue has been declining consistently for a while so the bigger thing is more of well what are you going to be doing right now if you do want to go and like go with the major label model then you need to be prepared to go and like <coughs> wait for a very long time potentially and most likely never get any help right and if you do it will likely only be when you're making enough money to where someone else wants a cut exactly right yeah like i'd say outsourcing your source of quote-unquote success like if if ever it's like that's something someone else's job is is that um Recipe well, and I think disaster. it's really it's really tempting advice just because of how tough as nails the industry is, right? Like you, it, it is not like oh, some people fail. No, no, no. The vast majority of people never even make it to market, let alone like do well in that market, right? Nowadays, there's so many things competing for people's attention and time, and the, like your art going and getting in front of someone else's face to begin with is a tall order, let alone having them click on it and hear it and, you know, connect with it, right? There's a lot of asks between point A and B, but I'm also kind of in the camp to say, no, fight with tools. Yes, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok have a monopoly over people's attention now, but, you know, unless you have a better idea for how to go and get to get in front of people, you got to kiss the ring. You got to pay him. Yeah, they've, for they've sure. They've twisted us. If we're going to go and do something about it, it's probably under the realm of government regulation, not, you know, I guess trying to fight that system from the outside. No, you got to go and get <laughs> the people you give all your tax money to to say, no, stop being a monopoly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they're like, it's like the government versus the companies are like a little tiny, eh, pulling at the pants string. And they're like, Oh, we'll think about it. But yeah, yeah it's right, wherever the eyeballs are. Yeah, wherever the eyeballs are. And um, <laughs> what you say is, is so true. Like, I, I find it, it's like today's day and age is easier in some ways than it's ever been. Like in the past, it's like gatekeepers. Like you needed a, a, a record deal and you needed investors and all that stuff to make it happen. So there was gatekeepers. Now, not so much gatekeepers, but it's like you need the whole skill set of an entrepreneur and business media company uh to make it happen and like you said yep. like there's so many asking points it's been so like um micro adjusted whereas all the asking points from somebody getting to know you to then being interested in what you do to then listening to your music and then they're not even going to buy your music in today's day and age so it's something else around it how else can you provide value oh, live man. show products some other way to t-shirt vip patreon like you have to get creative although now there's no gatekeeper but you have to be a creative business owner right it's well it's and although one might argue that it's not necessarily a lack of gatekeeper it's just a different gatekeeper this is true the gatekeepers the, the hands of the gatekeeper has changed now they're robot hands yeah. um <laughs> nice robot hands yes. um <laughs> But I was actually having a conversation with a bandmate of mine about that because, you know, it's kind of in musicians' it's... interest to go and be abreast of this sort of thing. But, like, now all musicians are, they're, like, we're just content creators with the rest of them now. Yep. Like, what else? And, yeah, that's not 100% true, right? But if you're thinking about it in a, if you want to do this for a living, make a career out of this and have enough fans to be able to go and pay a mortgage, and support a kid that would be crazy then you have to go and look at look at some of those facts like well 
to go and get access to the most people, you have to go through a platform. You got to do it. And you can do as good a job at going and creating content as you want. But most of these services still work like a, uh, you, you know, carnivals, how there's, you know, the, all the shady carnival uh, games. Yeah. And, but you walk into the park and you see some guy holding a giant gorilla and you're like, oh my God, I could get that. I'm, I'm stronger than this schmo. I got better aim than him. Right. And you want to think that you're better than most people. So you see gorilla guy and you're like, oh yeah. But the person at the carnival is not, he's not in like, he's not trying to just give away gorillas. He's baiting you. He's chumming the water, trying to get yeah. more people in there. And that's exactly what social media companies do. Like it's come out that they totally like they'll updraft some stuff. They'll basically say, okay, that post or this group or this channel now you're going to go and get traction. They'll be like, boop. And there probably just has an algorithm that randomly selects one in every million pages. Right? But you see the ones that go up the ladder and you're like, oh my God, that could, that's possible for us. And like, yeah, it's possible. Just like cancer. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I love, I love that painting of it because it's, it does have that essence of gambling, right? Whereas, if you're hoping for virality, let's put it that way. If you're hoping for something to just take you to the moon, it's kind of like much. trying to get the gorilla, right? But it's like, if you're not aiming for the gorilla, but you're like, huh, maybe I can like spend the afternoon playing games here with my family and come out, you know, breaking even or come out with like, yo, we got some prizes. It's not the gorilla, right? Like that's maybe more possible right and it's like yeah don't it's more one of those like don't be fooled by the games they're playing on us totally 100 percent. because like who knows maybe the gorilla is like the guy they just hired a guy from the carnival to rock around with the gorilla well and they might have like that's the yeah that's the that's the crazy uh, thing but it's yeah it's but again i think it's like that magical thinking right like right. don't don't think, oh, what if I win a ticket? Oh, yeah, and you might. And that'll be a great problem to have if you do. But don't assume it's going to happen. Figure out, like, steps you can take. Like, one of the things I'm working on right now with um, a couple of my groups is going and thinking about using, because we have big Facebook fan bases. Right. But we find ourselves not connecting with them because we have too many of them and Facebook's throttled us down. So we're not going to, they're not going to see any of our stuff unless we're paying them or a post just really goes and engages with a bunch of people like meeting their bar for engagement. Right. Right. So the only option, if we want to go and utilize that chunk of people is to pay Facebook. Got to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like the fact that we're not doing that is probably money left on the table for people who would, would have come to those shows. Right. Right. And it's, yeah, there's a whole other category of that is like eyeballs are good. Getting streams is good. However, that doesn't equal income. Right. So it's like, Oh no, not to, even a little bit. Right. So it's like people coming to your show is great. People listening to your music, but then it's like the whole other thing of if you're spending money on advertising. Is there an ROI or is it just you're spending money to get more Spotify plays, which is that's totally fine and cool. But, but there's people a get baited layer. all the time, all the time with that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yes, there are connections, right? Like, unless you go, I was it like one, 2000, I think it's like 2000 uh, regular streamers on Spotify. Now you're in the running. Now you're actually a part of the current. You're no longer in the shallows, right? Right. Now Spotify is going to go and pitch you for some of its playlists, or it's going to, you're going to show up in more people's feeds, but in, and it's a little honest with that because if you're under that amount of regular streamers, it just doesn't have enough data to work with to go and do anything with you. Right. Oh, it's like, you get it, right? Like that makes sense. But you know, that being said, you can go and get on as many Spotify playlists as you want. That still doesn't, that doesn't even earn you a dime, right? Streaming revenue is garbage. Right. And that's not and even a secret. <laughs> exactly. Like it's obvious that it's uh, like, even if you're looking for gigs, big gigs or like label stuff, it's like, Spotify plays as part of that equation. Uh, but then again, it's it gets into the realm of magical thinking where it's like getting a certain amount of Spotify plays might help, but it's like, it's not the gorilla necessarily. <laughs> right. And it's like, don't, and I, I keep thinking, it's like, yeah, don't, don't confuse ignorance with magic. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why that happened. It's like, no, you don't know why that happened. That doesn't mean it was inexplicable. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rapid but, yeah, fire so, questions what else what else yeah right yeah <laughs> super rapid fire well, i like that i got a second to think about that last one that was nice oh, that but, was a good uh, one that was leisurely, valuable you know? real talk for anyone who makes it this far <laughs> in the episode real talk um reality yeah. talk so what's an unusual habit or absurd thing you love 
Um, I'm big into puns. Puns are great. Uh, big into puns. Upsetting humor. No, it's actually a specific thing I really like where you go and you upset someone in a way that they can't get up. Like they can't get like, they can't yell at you about it. Like, it's not like you offended someone with something reasonable. It's just something that's like a little wrong or a little different. And they're like, uh, like that's, I, I, I live yeah. for that. I live for that so much. <laughs> yeah, pun, pun, I would say puns live in that world where it's like, uh, like you say something and it's yeah. like, it gets right in that And they're area. like, I have to tolerate you for how much longer? Like that one. Love it. <laughs> one of my, actually, no, one of my favorite examples of that is going and doing like a colloquialism, uh, but just not giving them the last part. <laughs> like a stop clock's always right. Or you better, it's like, uh, was it? Hey, that's like killing two birds. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how like your brain automatically fills in the blank, but you're like, it didn't well, happen though. Well, it's funny because in a lot of ways, it's I feel like I do that with music. I mean, shit, Mozart did that with music, right? That was one of the things he was known for is going into setting up like these phrases. And then just not giving you what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Denying You're like, the Oh no! It was a surprise, but you know. That's yeah. a huge move in, in songwriting is like confirming or denying expectations, even in film <laughs> plots, right? It's like oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's powerful. Um, so when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what do you usually do? Hide under my desk and cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh Oh, unfocused and unmotivated. That's a tough one because, you know, well, especially with the state of, you know, the entire music industry, it's not hard to feel that way. It's not hard to feel like maybe a little downtrodden. I've certainly had episodes where I'm like, why am I doing this? Also, what's the point? What's the point of doing any of this? Also, no one cares. Just, you know, just a nice little barrage of just, you know, nihilism. But I think that if you can stick it out and kind of get through some of that stuff, then it works a little, then like at least fill us like on a philosophical level, you can go and punch through it. You get to more like the existential, existential nihilism -y stuff where you're like, yeah, there's no point. This might not even work out, but you know, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing with my time. So I'm just going to keep plugging at it. I've come this far, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, or, or also like, you know, it's, I, I, I appreciate this for simply being able to do it, you know? Totally. And, but then for the more like moment to moment battle to battle stuff where you're like, oh, <laughs> like when you're feeling like that, I have found, or I'm trying to go and embrace the idea of being flexible and kind to myself. Like if I'm pushing myself up against a wall and it's just not, and I'm just making no progress, it's not moving. I'm trying to go and listen to my brain and my body and be like, okay, there's a reason that I, this isn't working. Now it could just be that I'm burned out, which is upsetting. And it's I feel like burn, like being burned out. It's like just getting sunburn in the Caribbean at this point, but <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's more burned out than not most of the time. But I think managing burnout is one of the biggest things that helps me with that, but also going and managing my workload in general and making it so I'm not like, oh, I just got to get through this and then it's going to be easier. No, 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 no. I have to go and structure my life with systems in a way that make it so I don't drive myself insane. That's how I'm looking at it now. Absolutely. Because if I, if I don't do that, I'm going to drive myself insane, like the premise said. <laughs> Man, so true. And uh, one thing that I've also been learning is what you said is taking a step back and being kinder in your self-talk when those moments come mm. instead of being like, you little, and then you'd be like, okay. Hey, Okay, let's oh my god no i had so i was working with this guy uh who is trying to help me with some digital marketing aspects of setting up the recording studio about this time last year actually and okay. we were on a phone call and we were talking about content and what sort of content i should be putting out there and he was like well from the content you put out there from like people sampling maybe seven pieces of content like look just looking down your page they should be able to kind of they should be able to get an understanding of what gets you out of bed in the morning and so he was like so what gets you out of bed in the morning? And I just reflect, reflexively said, oh, guilt. <laughs> and that was, then I still get stabbed. I was like, that's probably not good, is it? Uh, 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah but you know i've been trying to move away from the guilting myself into working hard model and do it maybe for more wholesome reasons that would be great yeah it, it's definitely different energy but uh <laughs> <laughs> it's it's you know it's a balance right like sometimes not guilt like when you're like oh i'm such a piece of shit i should do something versus like okay i want to do this because it's important to me like very similar slightly oh, different context yeah and that's actually that's what came I, I came up with a mantra after that which i use on and off but it's definitely it's definitely a better way to get reason to get up in the morning which is to make the world a stranger place than where i found it nice i like that it's <laughs> a good motto so and it's me... very attainable it's so attainable it is it's doable <laughs> you can just give someone a weird day <laughs> <laughs> let this day be weirder um, <laughs> so what do you know now that i don't like the word wish but i'm gonna use it that you wish you knew when you started down this path? Like what's something that in hindsight, you're like, yeah, if I would have known this, it probably would have been better uh, for people who are maybe a few steps back on their journey. That's a really good question. It's hard because there's just so much that would have been helpful to know up front. But one, I guess one of the things is if someone would have given me realistic expectations for it, which I know is a, such a big ask, right? but there is so much that is not explained right so much that is just kind of a given and i wish that some professional that i had taken lessons from or talked to would have gone and told me that no this is going to be impossibly difficult at times and sometimes you're not going to win you're not going to come out on top and that's okay right right like that is all a part of it i wish earlier on i had been told it was a war of attrition being that you have to just you basically outlast all of your competition <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually you're the only one doing the thing good and as long as you're not a dick to work with you'll be more or less okay yeah like what comes to mind for me in this in this field is like being finding some compass to keep you consistent even through all the bs and the pressure so that you come out a diamond right after a long yeah, time yeah, you're like yeah. oh damn like okay i get it well because people come out of it in all sorts of shape too right I mean, everyone comes out with their uh, their ass cut out of wood but like <laughs> you know it's i mean there's there's so many there's so many people i know well i mean even the fact that they never tell you up front going to school for music what the rate of people working in music after college is mm. right because that is lower um <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah. I can, I can probably count on one hand, the amount of classmates that I had at Milliken who are still working in music. Yeah. Who don't have a separate day job paying for the music work they went to school for. And that to me is a problem. I don't like that part. That would be great. Yeah. But I also like, I don't know people, cause people discouraged me for sure. When I first started wanted or was talking about going into music. Right. People were like, oh, no, you don't want to do that. You want to have a plan B. And then Teenage Ryan was like, plan B? Plan Bs are for people who don't who don't want to invest all their energy into plan A. Having a plan B goes and makes it, uh, basically goes and takes energy away from plan A and makes plan A less viable. So no, no, I'm not doing plan B. And I was right. But <laughs> the, uh, but the, the, the tricky, but the thing is, is that the reason you give yourself a plan B is not in case plan A doesn't work. It's to go and let yourself do something else if you don't want to do plan A anymore. Mm, it's giving mm. yourself another option in case plan A just turns out to be a stinker, right? Yeah. And that's what happens to plenty of people I know who were doing music and aren't now. And it, varying places along the path, they've jumped out and said, nah, fuck this. And <laughs> for entirely reasonable reasons. I am not – how I, you can't poo-poo anyone who is an amateur musician because they're an amateur being an amateur just means that they're like doing it for the love of the craft weird, <laughs> weird. how dare you not doing it for not doing it for soul paper come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah one thing i find with like i find most people they have a plan a in mind with music and then they might have a plan b but what ultimately ends up happening is this weird plan c that's like 
something that works to sustain yeah. your efforts towards some version of what plan a yep. could have been <laughs> right well and, and, and right because plan a is made by someone who's ignorant exactly right you're like this is the way <laughs> you're like oh that didn't work <laughs> and you what, what 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 data are you drawing from tv okay okay movies all right all right the bands you listen to hmm okay so like the one percent of the one percent fine <laughs> yeah. i'm sure that's super attainable don't worry about it it's fine <laughs> you got this <laughs> <laughs> probability never tell me the odds yeah that that sort of thinking yeah <sighs> but you know that's how that's how it goes but you have to kind of make your peace with that and figure that out but I think that actually the plan C thing is a really great analogy for that because that is really what happens is you figure out what doing the thing you actually want to do is like, and then you just keep looking around for other shiny things that are on the way to there that might also interest you. Right. Absolutely. Like that's what happened with the, that was Tim Minchin's advice. You ever hear a Tim Minchin? I haven't. He's an Australian like comedy pianist, but okay. Actually, about a decade ago, he just really popped off, did the Edinburgh thing. Um, but yeah, that was his advice because he was just kind of doing musical theater stuff, cabaret stuff in Australia, but then didn't really take off and slowly started, you know, he just upped his look. He like got a stylist then started going and like having this one man piano comedy show and it's brilliant, right? Right. But he, that was his, he did a whole like graduation speech and he was like, yeah, be focused, but don't be so focused on the thing you want that you don't see the shiny thing out there that, right. you, that you could go and get, right? Yeah. Have the eye for the opportunity for sure. So this next question is kind of an asshole question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, top three desert island albums. Let's try, I think, the longest one. <laughs> <laughs> um oh gosh top three desert island albums mm, that's tough okay one of them planet of ice by minus the bear nice planet of ice by minus the bear is a tremendous album and i love it dearly and i could listen to that thing on repeat for a while before i get bored Ooh, somewhere in the between by streetlight manifesto cool excellent ska album uh my favorite ska band of all time their horn section is amazing their arrangements are amazing oh god um and then i want to do a cake album but there's not one album in particular i'd like more than anything i'd actually say talent of the hawk oh mm, it's either talent the, for number three it's either talent of the hawk by the front bottoms or plans by death cab for cutie nice cool right on <laughs> right on right on some people are like get destroyed by their they're like how do i frame this like i'm on a desert island but you you do it <laughs> <laughs> um so this last one's hilarious hippie question um but if you could send a text message to everyone on earth uh in their language and then understand it what would it be <laughs> oh um uh new phone who dis <laughs> love it <laughs> uh great <laughs> awesome so with that said let's uh that wraps it up where can people nice. go to find out more about ryan and all the awesome things you're doing okay so i'm so you can go to any of those band pages to hear more about the bands those are all pretty sick i have a website ryancaldwellmusic.com birdgardenstudios.com um those are very much under the process of being updated so you know maybe like wait a hot second before you go there but i am on instagram with bird garden studios if you want to go and give zuckerberg more money um <laughs> <laughs> otherwise uh the other another good place to go is my spotify uh, i have a spotify playlist for bird garden studios bird gardens on spotify ryan caldwell's on spotify and i've got a bunch of the stuff i produced all curated right there in a nice neat and tidy playlist amazing great i will link that in the show notes underneath here so you can find all those lovely places on the interwebs and with that Woo. said thank you so much for joining me ryan this was awesome yeah man it's good to hang out with you <laughs>